I'm Daniel Jackaway, and this summer, thanks to Ruby Summer of the Code, I worked on Rubato, which is working on bringing Android apps, or Ruby to, to writing Android apps, so you, uh, bringing Ruby to Android so you can write apps in Ruby. And so today I'm going to talk about that and some related projects. So first of all, why are we, like some notes about mobile. First of all, it's surprisingly new. Even though basically everyone, including your mom, has an iPhone, the App Store is only two and a half years old. So really, there's still a lot going on. There's a lot of new stuff. Like We really have only scratched the surface in augmented reality, for example. There's a lot of new stuff to do with mobile. And now tablets are coming around to add even more custom ones. Also, for some people, it's very lucrative. It's hit or miss, but there are some big wins. You know, Any venture is going to be hit or miss. But there, at least people are finally willing to pay for your software again, unlike online, where consumers usually aren't willing to pay. But you do have to use either Objective-C or Java um, right now in general. And that's not the best option in, for, in the opinion of most people at Ruby conferences. So if you say like, hey Apple, you know, you guys are sponsoring Mac Ruby, right? Like, can we maybe, if we ask nicely, no. No Ruby on iPhone, at least for the time being, that's just not gonna happen. But Android can run anything that the JVM can run. So that includes Clojure, Scala, Jython, and even JRuby. Now, JRuby does give you portability um, to run anywhere the JVM can, which includes App Engine and Android. But it's also just a really cool thing in general. It's pretty fast, roughly in line with 1.9. Um, it, it has native threading, so you can saturate all the cores with one process. Um, give, you can call Java, you can talk to Java libraries. There's all kinds of cool things about JRuby. LinkedIn is using it. You should definitely think about it. Um, so now I'm just going to give you kind of a whirlwind overview of the Android API so that we can, because I'm assuming you guys don't really know much about the API as much as you know about Ruby. <coughs> so first of all, the two main visual elements are activities and views. An activity is generally going to be one screen full of things, so it's kind of um, analogous to a web page on when you're doing web development. So you'll have one activity that has a bunch of view elements within it, which are the views. And then as you like, when you shift to a new view, that's like a new, a new screen, that's a new activity. I'm going to illustrate that with like a demo. So this is like pretty much the first Rubato script that I wrote. It's a very simple craps, the gambling game script. So this whole thing is one activity. And then each of these text boxes and buttons is a view. And then if I click this, this takes me to a new activity. And this is a view of what's called a list view. And if I click this, this is yet another activity. These are both views. And all of of it. One cool thing about Android UI is that basically you can always use the back button to get to the last activity you were on. So whereas in um, the iPhone, when you have a Twitter client or something and it wants to open links, it has a special API called Open an Embedded Browser so that you can then just quit it and get back to the app. With Android, um, you can just hit the back button. It sends you to the normal browser and when they hit the back button, it takes you right back to the last activity, which was a different app, which was the, the Twitter app or whatever. So that's just one note. Um, so then I go back here, I'll click this, this is a view. And I lost my bet, which is a shame. But that's just, like, so that's a quick idea. At each screen full is an activity and each thing within it is a view. Then things that are a little hard to get illustrate visually, there are broadcast receivers, which basically pretty much any event, you can say, I want a broadcast receiver to get it executed when this occurs. So that's everything from there's a time tick event which basically just fires every single minute, and that way you could do like some kind of cron-like thing if you want, or stuff like that. Um, and then it goes all the way to more interesting stuff, like there's an SMS received event, and so you have to get, you have to ask for the permission for that. But that means that any time they receive an SMS, you can be notified of that and then take advantage of that. Um, and then there's also services, which run in the background. So the way Android's multitasking works is basically when you're on the activity, it's running. Um, and using CPU and all that. But then when, they, when someone moves on to another activity, either within the app or to another activity in a different app, then that'll get paused. And it won't get killed, but it might get killed later if it needs the RAM back. So anything that you need to have keep going, even that when the app isn't running, you do in a service. So for example, I have a tethering app that lets me share my phone's internet with my computer. And there you open up an activity to tell it to start tethering. But then it does the actual tethering in a service, and that way if the activity gets killed, I still have internet on my computer. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of XML config, which is where you do things like define what, um, like the name of your app, 
Um, you can do layout in there. That's where you ask for permissions for more sensitive stuff like asking their, like getting their location or reading their SMSs and all that stuff. So that's a quick overview. There's also, it's kind of all built on callbacks. So for example, you'll subclass activity and your activity will implement the onCreate method which gets called when it gets started. And then on pause is when they move on to another activity. So that's where you would save state and stop running CPU intensive stuff. And then there's an interface on click. So um, for a button, you would pass in something that implements the on click, which might be your activity depending on how you set it up. So basically, the whole thing is when stuff happens, some method gets called. And then Rubato would translate those to blocks. So basically, instead of an on create, and instead of defining an on create method, you call this handle create, and whatever is in your block gets, um, gets executed when that happens. And the way we do that is basically, under the normal Java API, like if you're, if you're implementing an activity, you, your activity would directly subclass activity, and then you would define the on create, the on pause, etc. But the way, what we do is we have this Rubato activity in between. And what the Rubato activity does is define all the methods that might be called back, and all the code that's there basically says, push this on to Ruby, and execute Ruby, and give it the parameters, and all that. And we do that with a very ugly .java.erb file to generate those, the robots activity file. But you don't have to know that. You don't have to worry about that. So now getting into the heart of this, which is talking about robots. Um, so it started out just as a little IRB app. If you want to, you can download it right now if you get a barcode <coughs> scanner app, if you have an Android phone. If you don't have a barcode scanner app, I can't give you a barcode to download that. But um, you can always get it later, too. I'll give you a link at the end. Um, and basically, Charles Nutter, who's on the JRuby core team, wrote it because he wanted to start playing with getting JRuby on the um, on Android. It was just it, had, it was an IRB, so just like an IRB on your phone where you could type stuff in and it, it would show you the result. And then also you could save little scripts, like multi-line scripts, and then run them later. So that was useful and pretty cool, and it allowed for some nice things like if I'm out and I'm talking to people about Ruby and wondering about weird language quirks, I sometimes pull it out and try it on my phone, which is nice, and I don't have to SSH into my compute my server like I used to do on my iPhone. Um, but it did have some limitations. You could only script activities. You couldn't do the broadcast receivers and services and other stuff. You couldn't ship an APK, which is the compiled Android um, package of your script. You would have to tell them, you know, download robots.rb, download this script, run the script. It wasn't as clean. And then also, you didn't mess with the XML config, which meant, first of all, some of the layout stuff is easier to do with that. And also, it meant that the Roboto IRB app just requests all the permissions that are possible, so then every script would have the ability to do all kinds of crazy stuff to your phone. And so, this is like it was a good starting point, but obviously, we needed more. That's where I came in, and this summer, I worked on making Roboto Core, which is for a full apps. <coughs> The goals of it are basically, I want it to be able to expose the entire Java API to your Ruby scripts, but at the same time, not actually require the, you to write any Java. Um, and then eventually, there's going to be plugins. So the idea is, um, I see it kind of like Sinatra, where it has a very tight core that basically just exposes functionality and, is, and stays out of your way. But then people can write plugins on top to make a nicer interface and make it easier to do certain things. Um, and also, I want to, I haven't done this yet, but I want to make it so you have to write little to no XML because no one likes XML. Um, so the first demo that I'll do is just going to be, I'm going to show how you would create a starter app and then show what that, it, it gives you an app that does a little bit of functionality. So first of all, before you make a starter app, you're going to need the JDK, obviously. Um, you need JRuby, and one good way to install that is RVM, because, and RVM also makes it easy to switch between JRuby and Ruby, and you can also switch between your versions of Ruby. It's pretty cool. Um, you need the Android SDK, and then you probably want to generate an emulator. You can develop straight on your phone, and there are some advantages to that, but having an emulator is nice. Um, you can just like blow, it, like blow it away if you need to. You have root access to it, whereas you might not have root access to your, root access to your phone, which is useful. And there's some other stuff. Um, that's useful. And then once you've done all that, you just gem install robots and core. So then to generate an app, I'm not going to go through all this, but the main important thing to know here is that the package, the Java package, is how Android differentiates between apps. So you need every app that you write to have its own unique package. If you, you won't even be able to submit it to the market if you have, if you, there's already one with that package there. 
but it would overwrite if you were to just be working on an emulator or on your phone directly um, if you were installing with the same package as one that was already there. Um, and this is basically a drop-in replacement for Android Create Project, which is the, um, if you were writing just a normal Android app, how you would, uh, how you would generate that. So that's just you know, nice. Um, so this is, you can, what that does is it basically creates, it gives you all the files that um, develop, that producing a normal Android app would give you because it actually calls Android Create Project behind the scenes. But then it throws in a few other things, like it throws in those Roboto activity .java files and a few other things like that. And then it also gives you um, asset scripts is where you, basically where you're going to be spending all your time. Um, it gives you a asset scripts Roboto.rb, which is the first thing you require because it's what makes everything after that work. And then it also, you I was back here I specified that I want the, the first activity that um, from when you launch to be called high activity, because this is just like a hell world-ish thing. Um, and so then that's why it's high underscore activity.rb. Um, so just going through this, this is all pretty much boilerplate. You require robots.rb, then you ask for the view elements that you're going to need. And then you basically put everything in your handle create method. You wouldn't have to. Um, the blocks that follow, you could say activity.them and put it outside the handle create, but you don't have to say activity. if you put it within that. And then set title just sets this little title bar at the top and it sets the text there. And this is a bundle which basically just gives you a bunch of information and that's, this is, that's the, um, the parameter that gets passed to on create. So Roboto just passes that on to you to do whatever you would need to with it. So then getting into the more interesting stuff. Okay, um, so setup content is where you put all the content that's gonna be there when you start. Um, so this is saying that the outermost view is going to be what's called a linear layout, which basically just has other views within it and puts them linearly. In this case, we're saying that we want it to be vertical, so it's going to be one on top of the other. Um, the other option would be horizontal, obviously, so it's like the first one that you put in would be to the left and then over. Um, so here, what makes the text view is this call the text view element, and then we're just stashing it in a, an instance variable so that we can use it down here. And then we say text, that's pretty obvious. Um, then here we also want a button, which says, um, which, yeah, maybe I should show you guys this thing first. Um, but I'll get through this actually. Um, so, and then there's a button with text MX Butterfly, that's a reference to an XKCD comic. Um, and with wrap content, which means that you want the width of the button to be the same as the text. Um, and now I'll show you guys what this does so you can understand the last part. Um, now this is going to be slow, and I will explain to you why this is going to be slow. It's not that JRuby is that slow, but it's that we use a lot of reflection, what's called reflection, which is the Java equivalent of calling dot methods in Ruby. It gives you all the methods that something can use and it tells you their types, uh, like what types they return, what, how many parameters they take, and what types those parameters are, whether it's public or private, all that good stuff. Um, and that the, the libraries on um, Dolvik, which is the actual VM, it's not quite a Java virtual machine, it's just, and it's just you know, a replacement for the Java virtual machine. The Dolphin reflection libraries, they've told us are really slow, and eventually they're gonna make them faster, but it didn't make it into gingerbread, the next version that's coming out now, so it's gonna be a while. We're gonna work on lessening our need for the reflection as well. So this is what you get. As you saw, there's a text view and a button, so that's there. And then when you click it, two things are gonna happen. It's gonna change that question mark to an activation point, and it's gonna put a notification down here. So see. And the way it does that is it says handle click, and then it passes in the thing that gets clicked. Um, and then this is just a check, so that if something else got clicked, then it um, because if you were using that same on click method for multiple buttons or something, then you'd want to see which one it actually was. And then you just say it's text me that set text. And then toast is a notification thing that's built into Android. And then you just close this, and this end closes the block up here. Um, and then there's various ways to install. This isn't very interesting, and you can find it on the readme. But the main thing is to make sure that you're using JRuby's rake, because it, um, it needs that to talk to Ant, which is the Java build tool that um, Android uses. Um, and so the easiest way is to RVM use JRuby, and then everything after that would be JRuby's rake. But you can also just JRuby-s rake with, um, for every rake call. And then one cool thing is that there's rake update scripts. So whereas if you're using a Java 
app, you'll have to recompile the whole app every time you make a change. If you just make changes to your Ruby code, you can just run, um, and you have root access to the, the, to the device you're using, which is part of why you want to use an emulator, then it can just copy the scripts on, and then you don't have to recompile it and reinstall. You just copy the scripts and then you can restart and see the new changes. So that can help you develop a little bit faster than you might be able to with Java. Um, and now here's a little bit more of an involved demo that actually does things. Um, so I guess I'll show it off first. Um, basically, I want to use the I wanted to do something with the hardware because that's what is interesting about mobile, really. And so I made this demo. I'm going to um, actually open the photo booth so that I can show it to everyone. Um, but basically, what it does is it uses the accelerator to see when you move the phone, and then it changes the background color um, when you move it, but not when it's still. So it's it's, it's still right now. It's kind of sensitive. I should change the it's still right now, but then if I move it, it's kind of hard to see. You can see it up here too. So, <laughs> but, um, so yeah, so that, let's see how we do that. Um, All right, so this is a bunch of. So um, this is the same basically as what you saw before. Um, and then we just have a text view in this case. It, it says shake really small. You can actually see that. But then, and then there's a bunch of imports. We need more because we need like the sensor stuff and the color stuff. Um, then when launch is the same as handle create, it's, uh, it's alias in that way. Whereas <coughs> with a broadcast receiver, you have to know that it's on receive. And with a service, I think it's also on create. When launch will work for all of them. It's an idea just to kind of make people not have to think about <coughs> what the actual underlying API is quite as much. Um, so then we set title again, just like before. Then we, um, this gets us a, what's called a sensor manager, um, this line here. And then we um, ask for all of the accelerometers from that sensor manager. So, um, so we ask for a list of the sensors that are type accelerometer. And then we check if it's empty, because say on the emulator, you're not going to get any accelerometers because there aren't any. And that way it won't totally crash if it's empty. But otherwise, then we set an instance variable to be it so that we can use it later. Um, and then actually the most important thing next, hit, um, on resume also gets called on create. So um, we put, you want to put anything that needs to happen anytime you resume in there, and we get called both times. So on resume, we're going to we're going to register the listener, which means that we want to get get notified when things happen, and then on pause we unregister that because we don't want to know that they're shaking if they're not actually on our activity because we don't want to be updating stuff. And then going in to see what happens when it does shake. Um, it passes in this sensor event um, object, and then we make sure that it is an accelerometer because again, we might be using the same method to deal with like um, some of the other sensor types, like a proximity sensor. And then if so, then this is just a convenience method, so we don't have to keep calling dot values every time. And then this is to add a threshold to make sure that they're shaking it enough that we want to change it, because otherwise, like even as it was, like my unsteady hand sometimes was shaking it. So then this is make sure that that's like taking the magnitude of the acceleration vector. Um, and then this is the line that changes the color. So it changes to a random, um, this, like, this is a random color here, the color random 55, 55, 55. Um, and then set, and then that makes a color, what's called a color drawable, and then it sets that to be the background drawable. You don't need to know all the specifics there necessarily. You, could, you, you would look in the Android documentation if you were actually trying to write this. And so that's like, it really isn't that much code. And it's a little bit, um, probably a little bit simpler than it would be in Java, and it's it really easy. So, moving on. One thing that you probably noticed is that it was slow. I already had this one, the one I did on my phone wasn't slow because I had it started out before, but the one before was slow. Um, a little bit slower than it would be on a phone. I think I figured out that a Hello World takes around seven seconds on a phone, but it's still not really acceptable for production use at this time. But it is possible to get you some of the benefits here, but actually usable today and fast, is what's called Mira. Which, um, this is a language also by Charles Nutter. Um, it, it's a JVM language, at least for now, although he actually has it set up so it'd be pretty easy to say write a C++ backend or a .NET backend as well, which is one of the benefits to it. And it, it the goal is to have as much of a Ruby-like syntax as possible. So, and you'll see that in a second. It even has closures and all that stuff, meaning blocks. Um, 
but it's statically typed, and the big thing here is it has no runtime dependencies. So whereas a Hello World app for Rubato is around 10 megabytes, but it still has to ship with the JRuby jars, a Mira Hello World app is, and, it, and that also slows it down because it has to start all of JRuby just to do these little things that you pretty much can write yourself in Java. Um, the Mira, it compiles straight to, you can choose either to Java code or to Java bytecode and uh, compile Java. So that means that it's basically as fast as Java you would write. You're, you'll see it basically generates the Java you would write, but not quite. So it's got the speed, and it means that you don't have this big, um, this big startup value where you have a, a big jar that's slow to load for some, when you're just doing Hello World or something small like that. It just grows as, as a Java. So this is the Hello World in Mira. It is exactly the same as it would be in Ruby. You get instance variables, you get the string inserting, you get all that. Um, and then slightly more complicated would be Fibonacci. Here, the only diff from Ruby is that you have to tell it that it takes a fixed num, which it then translates to the right kind of integer on the back end, depending on which back end you're using. Um, note that you don't have to tell it your return type because it can infer that. Um, so that's pretty cool. And the Java code that it generates is really not that scary. It, it's a little bit weird, and this whole thing will be on one line, but it didn't fit on my slide. But except for the fact that it's using the ternary operator and it's all on one line, that's pretty much how you would write this in Java. So that's, and that means that it's going to be just about as fast as, what, as how you'd write it in Java. Oh, I should have. Um, so demos of that. Um, technomancy wrote this thing, Garrett, which I will not show you the code to, because it's um, fairly long, which just has a bouncing ball. Um, but, what, but what I did is I just took, it's really pretty much just a straight Android application, but he added one task to Ant, the build tool, um, to, to compile the Mira to Java code before doing the rest of the build. But and I just, I basically stole that and wrote, more or less rewrote the Hello World that I just showed you in Rubato in Mira. And I'll show it, I won't show it to the screen, but you guys can. Um, so this is what a Hello World app, which I'll sh um, show you, would look like in Mira. So first of all, look at how fast this loads. It loads basically instantly, just like a Java one would. And then I didn't do toast, I didn't do changing this button size, that's a little bit of a pain, but you can see it, it does the same fun basic functionality. And this, looks, um, so you do all these imports. Some of these imports are things that we did in the uh, that Rubato.rb did, and some of them are things that um, Rubato.activity.java did. And then you see it's pretty much, it's a little bit different. You can't, you don't get like passing in hashes and stuff. You could also change some of this layout to be in XML, and that, they claim it's easier, but I don't, I'm not a huge fan of XML. But it really is pretty self-explanatory and straightforward, and it doesn't look like Ruby. You have this block here, you know, um, and it's not that complicated, and yet it still feels like Ruby. You don't have to work out your right pinky so that you can get all the semicolons in, etc. Um, but one thing, which is kind of, <coughs> if you look back at what the uh, what this looked like, this does feel more Ruby like it's all blocks and stuff, and that also means it's a little bit easier to write um, build abstractions up from this because you could write blocks that call other blocks. And so that's one of the things I'm seeing with, I'm hoping for with Urazo is that plugins will be, it'll be pretty easy to write a plugin that's powerful and makes things easier. So, um, moving on, one um, thing that you might have heard of is what's called scripting layer for Android, which is another way to write Ruby code for Android apps. Um, these are quotes from their website. Scripts have access to many of the APIs available to full-fledged Android applications, but note no, that that doesn't say all. And then they try to they aim for a greatly simplified interface. They do have an impressive list of languages that they um, support, including TCL and Lua and Beanshell. Uh, and they are planning to add even more, which is cool. And you might have seen, um, there was a blog post a few months ago that had a spy camera app, which was pretty cool. They vendored in Sinatra, and then they had the app um, you would go to the your phone's IP, like usually over Wi-Fi you can do that. Um, and then what it would do is it would take a picture with the camera and then render you a view that served you that picture. And that was pretty cool and it was really clean code. It took about 30 lines to do that. 
But, and so it is a great project, but I think that it's not the best approach, at least for what I'm aiming for. I want Roboto to expose the full Android API so that once we get speed under control, people can use that for <coughs> any app they want to. And even things where, where really you care about being able to, having full freedom, you can do with Roboto. So it seems like scripting layer for Android is more for hobbyists and playing around with it. Um, whereas uh, I'm aiming for exposing everything and that for allowing you to do more, um, even um, everything basically. And then ways that Roboto can be better than the other options. First of all, Ruby. Second of all, break up the scripts cool. Second of all, and third of all, as I said, the, the abstractions, the ability with this block based thing, you could write plugins pretty easily that just call their blocks and like <coughs> make a whole bunch of text use. It's a little bit it's a little bit more powerful because it's Ruby and because it's um, closures and all that. And then ways that you can help. First of all, just use it and then complain when things are broken or confusing, because there's probably some things that don't work that well that we just don't know about because there aren't that many people using it. And then um, one level up would be when something's confusing, you contribute documents. So like if you like if you find something confusing but then work your way through it and you know, ask us in IRC, then you could go to the wiki and update that and update them to make it more clear for future people. And then one step up would obviously be forking it um, and contributing to the actual code. And then soon we'll also have a plugin architecture so that you can write plugins and help that one. Um, so I'm going to go fast. But uh, this is, that's basically it. Um, thank you a lot to Charles Nutter, because first of all, he is much of the reason why JRuby is, is as mature as it is. So without him, we wouldn't even necessarily be able to do this. And also, he was my mentor for Ruby Summer of Code. Um, thanks for all the Ruby Summer of Code sponsors, because that's how I managed to do this. Um, and also, early contributors, who you probably haven't heard of them, I don't know them Scott Moyer, Dan Burkell, and Jane McGavin have all been pretty active in pushing this and working on code. And if you have questions, you can ask me now or find me after this. Um, I'll be around for the next two days. And then all the, everything I referenced here, this is my slides, the demos, like links to Roboto and stuff are all going to be on my blog. Actually, all already are. That was really fast, but I'll take questions. Building path to back end on it, um, roads or say uh, Catalyst Catch Port for for Android, or are you simply using typically the, the uh, SQLite three. Okay. Um, what are you asking? What type of back end is typically used for the apps on this for, for storage? Right now, not much. Um, you can write to the file system will be the main thing, but we're going to add, um, as we, we only support a few of the classes right now, but as we, it shouldn't be too hard to move on to support all the classes, and, pro and that includes the SQLite helper class or whatever it's called to let you use SQLite. Mm -hmm. So there's no use of anybody using Rhodes? Uh, um, Rhodes is kind of separate. Yeah, so since it's in Ruby, I wonder how if there was any between those I don't two know. Ruby systems? Not to my knowledge, because Rhodes, like, you write it in Ruby and that, that compiles it down to the Java or the other. This Here you're actually interpreting the Java on the device, oh, or then the Ruby on the device. And it's, it, Rhodes is totally separate, is the short answer to that. Other questions? <coughs> so what about the rest of the Android SDK? What do you mean? Stuff in Eclipse, the uh, emulator, well, the emulator, I mean... Building the resources. All right. Um, well, there's some... I, I'm, I mean, I have rake tasks and stuff that um, the Roboto command line tool can do for some of the stuff that Eclipse would do, and I guess that will expand in the future. For the emulator, it's not that hard just to generate it yourself, really. And so that's like the short answer, I guess. Are you planning on building any kind of like a testing framework? And I know that's like um, I haven't really thought about it. Like, obviously, eventually that would be good, but I don't really. I think first thing is to get it fast enough to actually use and ex exposing the entire API. But then, yes, testing would be good if you want to write that. Uh. <laughs> um, for someone like just starting development on Android, why would you recommend using um, Roboto over like just going in with Java and 
because you like Ruby. <laughs> and also because, as I said, eventually, um, I think that we'll be able to make a simpler interface between the block-based interface that we have and possible plugins on top to make it even easier. But, I mean, if you want to write an app right now, don't use Rubato, use either Mira or Java. And Mira so that basically is Java, in the end, will give you all the things that Java would give you, pretty much. Uh, so I noticed all your examples, you have a pretty heavy DSL in Rubato. Yeah. With a lot of blocks on it. The Mira examples use just the subclassing. Yeah. Way to do it. What was, when designing Rubato, why did you decide to go with the DSL instead of just um, well, the DSL is already there, but there's also, I think it's, Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's not actually possible on the phone to subclass, to have a Ruby class, subclass Java classes, right? I think we think, because it needs to generate bytecode to do that, and we can't generate Dalvik bytecode at the time. The way the Android API works is that you write Java code, it gets compiled to Java bytecode, and then the Android tooling compiles it to Dalvik bytecode, but you can't do that on the phone. I, I guess we could, but we don't have we don't have support for it yet, and that would be a pain to add. Um, so with that not working, the only real option is to have these generated Java files and pushing it along to a, calling a Ruby um, script. I can answer that one yeah. a little bit more. You can, other than the fact that you can extend an activity in Ruby code, um, you don't necessarily have to use this DSL. You can just have a script that gets the dollar sign activity You don't have to you can go through and do the, the basically the same thing in Mira. You just need the extra little help for getting an activity. So you had mentioned before about uh, Java reflection being slow, and that you're having to yeah. improve the performance in future versions. So, like, what is the what is the plan in terms of this? Um, I think we haven't talked about it too much, but I think basically trying to do it ahead of like doing the reflection ahead of time and have it cache essentially would be the goal, but it's. It's a little <laughs> pain. We're not totally sure. I remember seeing, or I remember you when I'm using Rubato early on. There was a when you package JRuby in with the application, there was quite a large size yeah. package. With JRuby has any work been done to reduce the size of JRuby? Not really. We've thought about. We've talked about like trying to take out classes that you like certainly wouldn't need, but it's not yet. Do you have any, so one of the contentions in the Android world is that Google like basically just drops their next big thing. They worked on it in secret for a while and they dropped the open source. Has that fit you guys during the project? Um, not really, just the way we have it, we generate, we use reflection to generate the files, so, which means that it just goes through and asks for the methods and then pulls them all in. So it's pretty much, we can generate that in like five minutes or less, so not really. But it, I mean, if you want to plan how to what you're going to do with your app, then obviously that's a little bit of a pain. Okay.